After that, that's interesting. I've never heard of somebody doing that before. How to make videos like a pro start to finish from Tio Teo, however you want to say it, Crawford. Now I'm trying to find and break down the editing of some of the most creative people on YouTube. And this is what I found. Now, before we watch this, let's do some research. Okay, he has 218,000 subscribers and over 11 million views. And he's from Austria. I'm gonna go a little bit more in depth with this. Portfolio. Let's see what this is all about. Hey, I'm Teo, a photographer and filmmaker based in Austria. My photography mostly consists of scenes that I capture because something in them intrigues me. Okay. This usually means foggy atmospheric landscapes, details of everyday life or lighting that I just can't resist to photograph. Also, I have a collection of self-portraits because I like to have a subject in my landscapes, but most of the time go out to shoot alone. All right. My films are a mess. Anything from a short story to a 40 minute dystopian drama. I started making things in my teens and after school worked as a video producer in a marketing agency for a year. After that, I entered the School of Applied Sciences in Salzburg, Austria to study multimedia art. Interesting. With a focus on filmmaking. Back in October 2016, I launched my YouTube channel because I wanted to be like the people I watched on YouTube myself and put my work out there, albeit the videos were horrendous. We all start somewhere. By consistently making videos on YouTube for years, I slowly became better at the craft and also found my space on the platform. Now it is a channel about my artistic journey as a photographer and filmmaker. The videos range from behind the scenes episodes from my shoots to essay videos on photography related topics. After graduating from my studies, I decided to give the channel a try as my full-time occupation and so far I'm still alive. So far, it seems like he's doing pretty well. So now that we both understand a little bit more about him, let's watch his video. <laughs> Today, we're changing the subject a little. Instead of talking about photography, we're discussing video. In this video, I'm going to break down the process that goes into making my videos from the writing, the gear, the shooting, all the way to the editing and the final export. I'm hoping to answer a lot of questions concerning this process by making a video about how I make my videos. Let's begin. The vibe he's given off here is definitely a aesthetically pleasing. Uh, that's definitely a word that has become a lot more popular but anyway he was talking about editing he's going to break down the editing later on and so the editing is at 11 minutes later on in the video towards the end and then we'll actually be able to see his process behind that what he uses to edit and and everything he does which will be pretty interesting but talking about this first 30 seconds here one the intro was 30 seconds a lot of times on YouTube, I've said this before, inside the average YouTube video, people usually try to aim to say what's going to happen or what the video is about in the first 30 seconds of it. He's got this jazz track behind it that is very upbeat. It also fits the cinematic style that he has. It goes with the aesthetic that he's he's put for the video. Very warm. The color grade is very warm throughout. For some parts, he would add a sound effect that played through each cut on some things just to give it more, more definition. So on the part where he said, welcome, it cut to close-ups three times. You hear a sound effect behind each close cut. So with the part where he flips over the notebook and you see the video, one, he had to mask out his finger, but the orientation and it, it's overall just tracked to the piece of paper. It's so quick that you can't really notice, but it is a small detail that you might be able to notice if it wasn't there. And that happens a lot of times for, for different, different parts of editing. Willow tree, the last weekend of summer. If you've been following me for a while, you'll know that I have some general formats that my videos fall into and that there are structural similarities to how I make these. Most of them are based off of some sort of source material. That can be for example a shoot that I went on and documented, or a shoot I've planned and will be documenting, or something I'll be trying out, such as a film or a camera. If it's not simply me documenting a shoot like I did a couple weeks ago, then there usually is a pre-production process in which I create a rough concept. Usually the concept consists of what I plan on doing, what about it is remarkable, and what is the message, if there is one, that I want to convey in the video. Let's have a look at an example. Wherever he went through these title sections showing the different titles on it, again, there was a clicking sound or a sound effect that was put there each time it changed. 
giving it more definition and detail to that. Of what I plan on doing, what about it is remarkable, and what is the message, if there is one, that I want to convey in the video. And also, it seems to me, each time he transitions into a different section, especially with the music, he puts a muffled sound over it before it fades and then he overlaps both of the layers and so the next layer starts out muffled as it fades in and so it's a cross dissolve but it's also kind of a muffled type of transition he's done it twice so far i'm wondering if he's going to do it for the rest of the video my videos from the writing the gear the shooting all the way to the editing and the final export weekend of summer you've been following me for a while, I guess there's only one way to find out. Here's a video I published a month ago called Kodak's Most Underrated Film. What am I doing? Going on a shoot. What about that is remarkable? I'm shooting a film that is often overlooked. What is the message I want to convey in the video? That Kodak Pro Image 100 is an underrated film stock that is worth trying. The next step is to shoot the video, and for that I use a wide range of gear. Instead of telling you in little bits throughout the video what gear I use, I've decided to simply make the whole next section of this video about all my gear and what I use it for, so that you can find all the infos bundled in one place. Here we go. To film my shoots, the most common piece of gear I use is this little thing, a GoPro Hero 8. I use this head strap here to strap the GoPro onto my head, which I know looks a little silly, but I've learned to not care about it. This setup allows me to get these POV shots you know from my videos. Something I love about the GoPro Hero 8 is the fantastic image stabilization, which allows me to just walk around like usual and still get usable, not overly shaky POV shots of me practicing my photography. Then, for non POV shots such as these and such as my talking headshots. See, it's a videos. Creatives on YouTube always structure out one in a very cinematic film film type of way, but they always structure out their videos. It's always structured out into sections and, and stuff like that. And sometimes they'll do a lot of stuff in camera instead of editing over top. So for instance, his style right here, he the aesthetic that he's kind of giving he wants to portray that type of written handheld on a notebook clearly because he just did that he's done a lot of stuff with a notebook right now and so he's he's doing that in camera to give it that that style when watching the video because if he immediately started just throwing up crazy editing with a list and all this stuff it doesn't fit the video it's definitely good with this video at least that he's he's keeping the style throughout I use my main digital camera, which is the Sony a7 III paired with the Tamron 28mm f2.8. To briefly summarize the main reasons why I bought this camera back in 2019, this camera captures great footage with a wide choice of picture profiles such as S-Log, Cine or HLG, which is what I use. It is also capable of capturing clean low-light footage at night with higher ISO settings. Nothing crazy, but sufficient for what I do. I found that for me the limit is ISO 2000, which is enough for my purposes. Lastly, and actually the top reason for this choice back then, was Sony's famously incredible autofocus. As a creator who films a lot alone, and also appears in front of the camera all the time, I cannot constantly check- Yeah, his- the grading behind this is very, very film like a lot of you got the you got a lot of the warm green tones a, a, a cozy type of feeling if that makes sense with how it's colored and stuff like that i mean it is pumpkin spice season if you know what i mean but this was uploaded for for uh four months ago but it still gives off that feel like focus and so i knew that i wanted something with a reliable autofocus but if you don't understand what i'm saying i'm it's very well done i think the grading is is pretty good Focus and this camera seemed to be what I was looking for. Now, five years later, I can confirm that this combo has served me well and is still serving me well. I was initially a bit worried to pair the camera with a third party lens, however, that worry has been entirely erased. The combination works perfectly fine. Speaking of the lens, I chose it because I needed the wide range of focal lengths with the fixed aperture at f2.8. Sony does have one of their own, the 24 70 f2.8. I don't understand most of what he's saying here because I don't really research cameras like that. We're focusing on the editing, of course. Um, but if you are into that, 
It's a good day for you. Something that I have picked up on, though, his style in music that he really enjoys using is lounge jazz type of uh, type of stuff, which everybody's got their own unique taste and type of music they like to use. And this seems to be his. 2.8, but that lens is much more expensive. And so I decided to give the Tamron a try, which worked out great. Despite the Tamron having a wonderful wide range of focal lengths, I did end up buying one more lens, which I use all the time. It's a super wide angle lens, the Samyang 14mm f2.8. If you want to see a proper review, you can check mine out. I made one a couple years ago when I bought it. To give you an idea of how wide this lens is, here is the... No see, you can tell he understands what he's doing just from that clip that he referenced. You can tell he understands what he's doing with the style that he wants to show through editing because this clip right here, the color grading is very clean, very color corrected, if you want to put it that way, not really graded. So it's a very clean type of uh, type of look. Like, like for instance, take this and then you put it next to this. You can tell he's switching up the, the grade and stuff on purpose for a reason in the style of this whole video. Those small little details are what, what makes you, whenever you think about the video in a whole, instead of just, you know, what's, what's a cool effect I can put here or what's, what's the newest trend I can put. No, you think about the structure of the whole video to tie it in together. And that's what he's doing here. The a proper review, you can check mine out. I made one a couple years ago when I bought it. To give you an idea of how wide this lens is, here is the normal talking headshot you're used to seeing. This is the Tamron set to 28 millimeters. And this is what the exact same shot looks like with the 14 millimeter on the camera. Yeah, it's very wide. I initially bought this lens for a hiking series I shot in 2019, but it has ended up becoming a vital part of my kit that I still use in my videos all the time. Especially when shooting in a small apartment like I am, it can be very useful to have a lens that can fit things into frame even when they're quite close. Also, the slightly distorted, super wide angle look has a lot of character I find and adds a bit of spice to some of the cinematography. Sadly though, this lens is not aging as well as the Tamron. The autofocus was never as good as the Tamron in the first place, but now over time it has become even less and less reliable. So that nowadays, half of the time I'm using it in manual mode, simply because the autofocus doesn't work properly anymore. Now that we've covered the visuals, let's move on to audio. When walking with the GoPro on my head, I just use the audio from the GoPro, which is actually surprisingly good. But to record my voiceovers or capture the audio of anything I'm shooting with the Sony, I use this little Rode Video Micro. Back when I bought it, I bought this mic because I knew Rode was a good quality brand. However, I wanted to save some money and so I decided to pick one of their mics that are in the lower price range. And to my surprise, this mic is so good that I still haven't upgraded it. For my uses, this is perfect. Please note, however, that for my voiceovers, I do add a little bit of post-processing in the editing process. Yeah, so with these, with the, okay. We know that he uses Premiere now. I don't know if that's the only thing he uses. We're about to find out in a little bit. But with all of these, these screens here, he's got one, the same type of paper background uh, with the outline on the clip and then a piece of tape somewhere on it, like it's being taped to the paper. And that's just the style he's decided to choose for these, these screens right here, pretty much. Still keeping the same style throughout the video. Process to really get the best quality audio from this little microphone. By the way, in case you'd like to see a tutorial on how I edit my voiceovers, I actually made a tutorial a little while ago, which you can watch on my Patreon, where I generally post a lot of educational content. You can check it out via the link in the description. Also, one more accessory I use for audio is this long cable. This is a simple aux extension cable from Hammer, which I plug into the camera on one end and into the mic on the other end so that I can bring the mic close to me, which makes the audio sound much better. It was a, a one shot, but it looks like there's some like film grain over this, which obviously gives it that, that film look. But I wanted to make sure I was, you know, paying attention a little bit, a little bit more before I said anything. I don't want to embarrass myself. <laughs> All right. Lastly, let me show you one more piece of equipment that I use all the time, which is this light. Yeah, he, 
I don't know if it's the lens or if it's the filter. You can do it in post-production as well, in editing. But there's like this haze that blends in the highlights here. So you see how it kind of, it's going into the blacks here, the white kind of like fades and it gives it that, that aesthetic. Aesthetic! Gives it that, you know, that type of style. Got some sparkling water on my keyboard. And Softbox by Newer. I bought this in 2019 and I chose this light simply because it was cheap. As you can see, the lighting you can produce with this is great. It's such a good beginner light. Personally, however, I'm looking to upgrade this because you do really feel the low price when actively working with the light. The lighting looks great, which is the most important thing. However, the tripod feels quite wobbly and the light just never feels really stable. So that is where they saved, I suppose, to drive down the price. Anyway, that was an overview of the most important pieces in my gear kit, which allow me to produce my videos. Then, before we continue, okay. I want So, he's switched up the grade a little bit here to where it's not as um, not as warm. You got more more green tones, more blue and green. I mean, I guess a good way to to kind of switch up the feel throughout the video. I want to take a moment to thank the continued sponsor of the channel, Squarespace. Squarespace mm. is an easy to use all-in-one website platform. Is it only switched up for that? That's the real question. Rated. Now, after going out to shoot, I usually have anywhere from one and a half to two hours of GoPro footage or whatever other footage I recorded for the video. The next step is the rough cut. I think it was. So, there was a purpose behind switching up the color grade there uh, because it was its own section. It's pretty good. It's pretty uh, pretty good to keep in mind because it's an, it's an ad, obviously. It's not a part of the initial structure of the own of its own video uh it's kind of added into it so that was an indication through through color grading because it was it was different uh that it was a different section so that is uh that's that's pretty pretty interesting that he thought about that The rough cut, as the name suggests, is the first edit in which I get a rough idea of what footage to include and in what direction the video is going. By the way, for this part of the process, I've been working with an editor who helps me by doing the rough cuts and some editing for me before I tackle the rest later on. So shout out to Vini for always helping me out here. Once the rough cut is done, it's time for the video's concept to materialize into a script. The script can be very different depending on the video. Here are a few examples so that- Which, that makes sense. He has somebody kind of do the um, less creative work in a sense, I guess you could say. Like you said, rough cut, so just cutting out all the bad takes in the video or the bad angles or whatever kind of stuff he has going on. So he's able to take that footage, kind of the, the best of it, and put it together in a cinematic creative way that kind of He's thinking, which which makes sense. You understand. This video, in which I simply took you with me on a shoot on a fine spring day, was quite an easy script. I write an intro and set the stage in a way by describing what the video is going to be about and maybe adding some context such as why I went out to shoot or where I'm going. After that, I simply write my commentary in which I share my thoughts on the photos. A much more complex example is the video about the simple habit that will improve your photography. In that video, I interviewed my friend Flo on the topic and then integrated that interview in the video. I began the script by writing an introduction again and explaining the basic outlines of the point I was trying to get across in the video. Then, to smoothly integrate Flo into the video, I had already edited the parts of the interview that I wanted to include in the video so that I could then write the script around those parts because I wanted to create this back and forth between Flo and me. Finally, I wrote a conclusion to tie everything together at the end. So yeah, that... That, the floor that shot. Me. Finally. It looks pretty sick. Some of these landscapes, some of these areas with with what he's doing here looks pretty sick. Because you got that haze going over. Got that haze going over. All right. I wrote a conclusion to tie everything together at the end. 
Similarly difficult was the script for the video with Megan because there was so much footage in which Megan and I were speaking and so the script always had to be directly referencing the things we were saying in the footage because of course I don't want to be repeating myself. Anyway, once the script is written, it is time to record the voiceover. I got floaters in my eyeball, coasters by the shot glass, smoking let my mind fall, plenty roaches. To record the voiceover, I do something a little silly. Big music switch up. Uh, uh, I mean, kind of. It's, it has a, a jazzy type of lounge beat, but I was not expecting that to be uh, in, in, his, in his style here. But voiceover, guess what's after this? Rhymes with... It's editing. I do not have a proper audio recorder and I haven't been able to make my computer work as one and so I simply use my camera. I set up my camera like this with the microphone turned around facing me and sit here with the script in front of me and speak. Then later I simply extract the audio from the video file I recorded. To get the best possible audio quality I always try to keep my microphone at a good recording distance from my mouth, generally the closer the better, however I try not to get too close either. Once that is recorded I bring the file into you don't like this? You don't got you do all right. So it looks like we got Adobe Premiere here. No, I'll stop talking like that. So yeah, he's using Adobe Premiere. It's very common, very common for uh, for cinematic editing like this. The Premiere to export a wave file of the audio, which I then send to Vini, who edits my voiceover while I work on other parts of the video. In case you're wondering what needs to be edited on the voiceover, well, everything. Even though I've been doing this for years, I'm simply not capable of reading out my script smoothly in one go. Not even close. I keep making mistakes or pronounce something a little oddly and so I repeat my sentences. I am a bit of a perfectionist when it comes to this because I believe a smooth listening experience for you is one of the most important aspects of my videos. Anyway, once the voiceover is edited, it's time to get into the nitty gritty of editing. Yo, did he just spell out editing with the keyboard? I think he just did. No, but that is pretty cool. He's got, he, you know, he's, I don't have the cool lights on mine. No, but now he's got he's got strings with the music here. Actually, I want to see if it if the music faded Repeat out. Repeat my sentences. I am a bit of a perfectionist when it comes to this because I believe a smooth listening experience for you is one of the most important aspects of my videos. Anyway, once the voiceover is edited, it's time to get into the nitty-gritty of editing. Editing. Okay. This part of the process is, again... Yeah, so he's got classical strings kind of going on here, uh, showcasing the the editing, trying to make it as intriguing as possible. Because truthfully, most of the time editing, all of the action is happening up here. If you ever sit with somebody that's editing this, I mean, it pretty much looks like this. Yeah, so... Let's see how he makes this interesting. Different depending on the type of video. In a simple behind the scenes photography video like the one in which I took you with me on a sunny day in spring, I'll just edit from start to finish, shortening the video to only the relevant bits, working on the timing, adding music, and deciding which part of the footage should be matched to the commentary. On the other hand, when it's a more complex video, such as the one with Floor, or in fact, this one you're watching right now, I like to edit the entire audio first. So I'll look for all the music I want to use and work on the timing and all that and basically have a finished video but without the visuals, just the audio. After that, that's interesting. I've never heard of somebody doing that before. See what else he does. I decide what visuals I want apart from the source material. All the spots in between need filling and that is where talking headshots and b-roll come into play. I made the entire video as an audio experience already and then decide where the talking head parts could fit in and where I could add b-roll. To plan that, I add text into the timeline which describes the shot I want to use to fill this. Also, I use Premiere's labeling function to wow. color code the clips. Everything magenta is either a talking headshot or something that is going to become a talking headshot that I have yet to shoot. Anything labeled aquamarine is a clip that needs to be replaced by an animation that I'll work on in After Effects. And anything yellow is just generally something that needs replacing, usually it's just a placeholder for b-roll. 
After filling the entire video with placeholders, I basically made myself a shortlist. And so the next step is to shoot. Wow. So he puts together the audio and then he shoots the video later. And so he knows the exact length that the video is going to be before he's even shot it. That's interesting. I usually shoot the talking headshots first. I simply sit in my room lit by my softbox with the camera facing me and the mic in my hand to bring it close. Then I record the b-roll shots I need. That's this kind of stuff, me flipping through a notebook or working on something or showing you prints of photos. By the way, a question many have asked is how I print my photos and what printer I use. Sadly, I do not have a printer, instead I just go to the local drugstore because they also have photo processing services in their shops such as these on-demand printers where I can just walk in with a USB stick and connect that to the machine to get my photos printed. Anyway, with all the talking headshots and the b-roll done, it is time to import that material into Premiere and replace all the placeholders with the footage. That then leaves me with just the aquamarine placeholders which I tackle next. Those are my animations which I make in After Effects. That's this kind of stuff. And now we're coming okay. close to the end. The video is basically done. What is left are cosmetics. I want to make the video prettier, so it's time to work on some colour grading. I usually begin with the talking headshots and then simply copy the adjustment layer over to the next shots. And then I just colour the rest from front to back. I'm not going to dive into the actual colour grading process because that would just be too much for one video. As you've seen so far, this video is- What? No, I see. So he uses adjustment layers and yeah, this, this editing process is definitely unique. More of a general overview of how these videos are made. There are a lot of technicals to get into though, such as the color grading. Like with the audio, if you really want to see a tutorial on the color grading, I have multiple color grading yep. tutorials already on my Patreon. Those can hopefully help you out. With the color grading done, I also just work on some other finishing touches, such as checking the audio, mixing the levels for a better listening experience, adding sound effects where suited, and stuff like that. And then, at last, the final step is to export the video. For the final export that goes on YouTube, I simply use Premiere's preset setting called YouTube 2160p 4K Ultra HD. This will compress the video into a neat file that is still big but nothing enormous without a visible loss in quality. However, this requires a lot of compression and can take a long time, especially when working with a lot of effects such as grain. That is why I rarely export the timeline directly into this compressed format. Instead, I first render a ProRes 422 file, which is less compressed and will result in a huge file, but then I can simply import that file into Premiere and export it again, but this time in that more compressed format that is stored for YouTube, and this process takes up much less time than if you'd directly compress everything strongly. Interesting. And that concludes my process. Of course, every video has its own little differences, which I tried to make clear in this video, but mainly I wanted to provide you with a general overview of the process with a little dive into the gear and a- See, it's kind of slowed down a little bit here now, towards the ending of it. Throughout the video, there were, there were upbeat, and then slowed down a little bit, and then it was upbeat again, and then it slowed down, and slowing back down for the ending conclusion of, of the video, like it just says here. And yeah, let's see what else he has to say for the rest of this. A few other parts. I really hope this could help you out and answer a few questions. If you still have questions left, feel free to leave them in the comments, and I'll try to get back to them every now and then in between my work on the next videos. Before saying goodbye, I would like to say thank you to the lovely people supporting me in my work on Patreon. Thank you so much to each one of you. If you're interested in Lightroom presets, tutorials, or postcards, you can check out my page via the link in the description. Also, I have a print shop, by the way, in case that is of interest to you, also in the description. With that said, I hope to see you again soon. Until then, goodbye. Classic fade out. I like it. Hey. Yeah, I mean, that was T.O. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. T.O. T.O. Tomato, tomato. Crawford. Now, props to him because this is a 16-minute, almost 17-minute video, and I know that probably took some time to structure out, get the script right, do all that kind of stuff, and then obviously color grading, all that stuff for a YouTube video. And yeah, 
I mean, it was pretty sick. Another day of me finding another creative on YouTube. If you have any other suggestions of creatives that are on YouTube that, that really are passionate about their craft and what they do and how they put together videos, go ahead and leave a comment. And uh, yeah, if you want to see another reaction I did that's kind of similar to this, you can click right here and watch that. And with that, I'll see you at the next edit.